Welcome everyone, and we will be starting the presentation in about uh, 60 seconds. Welcome everyone, and we will be getting started in about 30 seconds now. Okay, it's time to get started. Um, welcome to this um, part, this uh, uh, project briefing, which is part of CNI's 2020 virtual meeting. Uh, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and I'm really just here to welcome you and to welcome um, Cal Lee from the uh, University of North Carolina um, School of Information and Library Science. Because we're doing this as a um, virtual meeting, um, Cal has been able to be joined by his collaborator, Cam Woods, and so you will get to enjoy not one, but two speakers as part of this presentation. Um, we will take questions at the end, which will be moderated by um, my colleague, Diane goldenberg Hart. And um, at the end, when you have questions, um, uh, please just use the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, please also feel free to use the chat as we go along. And with that, welcome. Thank you for doing this. And over to you, Cal and Cam. Thank you very much, Cliff. And thanks so much to CNI and for everyone who's been involved in organizing this. I know it was a lot of switching around on very short notice, um, and I'm hopeful for this this couple months of really exciting talks. Um, so we're going to talk um, today. Again, um, I'm Cal Lee at the School of Information and Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill, and Cam Woods, um, also at UNC, uh, will be joining me um, in a few minutes um, as we kind of switch back and forth during this presentation. So what we're going to be talking about is a project called RATOM, which stands for Review, Appraisal, and Triage of Mail. And uh, the primary motivation for all of this is that there are a lot of um, sort of digital curation, archival more broadly, tasks and functions that have been uh, significantly supported by research and development in software and hardware environments over the past few decades. Um, and arguably appraisal and selection is not really one of those areas. We haven't had a lot of progress on facilitating, supporting, enacting appraisal decisions through use of software, um, despite a lot of advances in other areas. Uh, but uh, we know that selection and appraisal decisions are based on various patterns. And when patterns can somehow be identified algorithmically, uh, that's a great opportunity to make use of software to try to bring those to the attention of a human being who's making decisions. Libraries and archives and museums frequently want to take actions that reflect various contextual relationships, which is also something that we can tap into. Um, and uh, timeline representations and visualizations, um, various ways to present the information can also provide useful high level views of the materials. What would be the motivation for looking at email? Uh, well, we've been creating it for more or less about 48 years. Uh, hundreds of billions of messages are generated every day. Most of them we know um, have relatively little long-term retention value, just like so many other records that people create uh, in contemporary society. But obviously some of them have a huge amount of value in documenting current activities, whether that ranges from the private sector, the public sector, nonprofit, people's individual lives. We just know that you know there's almost not a day, even in these current conditions, that we don't have at least some news story that's about something being disclosed or documented through email. Um, and despite the presence of numerous other modalities, we all know about, right, we're interacting through Zoom, there's, um, you know, there's, there's chat, there's um, all kinds of different environments that people are interacting with. Email still has this really uh, fundamental role that it plays. Uh, and they're often found in collections and acquisitions with other types of materials. So that's something we really try to be attentive to in this work as well, is that um, 
if you're familiar, for example, on the work that um, Cam and I and other collaborators have been involved in over the past decade related to, for example, acquisition of data off of disks and things like that, the reality is that very often collections involve multiple types of materials, including email. Uh, so a little bit about the RATOM, why this odd acronym? Well, it's a backronym in that the words really do represent what the project is about, which is review, appraisal, and triage of mail. Uh, but it's also a little nod to Ray Tomlinson and the role that he played in introducing email to all of us, um, either a hero or a villain in the story, depending on your feelings about email. Um, uh, this project is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, it started at the beginning of this calendar year and ends, uh, sorry, last calendar year and ends at the end of this calendar year. Um, we're developing and repurposing software, including machine learning and natural language processing for selection and appraisal uh, to build on top of existing environments, such as the BitCurator environment, which has also been developed through funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, and also hooks into other software and enhancements on things like Tomes, which is software that came out of a project at the State Archives of North Carolina, who are one of our primary collaborators. Um, and we're looking at trying to support um, what we've been calling iterative processing. So the idea is that as more information unfolds, you can make more and more decisions about things like appraisal. What is the content? How it should be described? What should be retained? Um, also mapping of timestamp and entity by which we mean named entities that can identify, be identified with natural language processing software. Um, sensitive features, things that appear that might need to be further reviewed or redacted and other elements across the tools. Uh, the team members um, are myself and then there at the bottom you can see Cam Woods who will be speaking to you in just a few minutes. Um, also at UNC Chapel Hill is Alicia Kinder who's our project manager, Antoine de Torse who's our software engineer, um, and then we have three partners um, at the State Archives of North Carolina, Camille Tyndall Watson, Jamie Patrick Burns, and Sangeeta Desai. And then finally, we have a set of collaborators through a company called Cactus Group, who are doing software development on an interface that we'll be showing you near the end of the presentation. Uh, so the scope of the project um, has several core uh, development goals designed to serve specific needs of collecting institutions that are dealing with email. Uh, this is primarily focused on the use case that someone has pulled down the email from a server into something like PST, OST, MBOX, as opposed to the idea of pulling things live off of, for example, an IMAP server. The whole tool chain could be applied after that, but we're not ourselves developing a set of tools that can be used to pull information off of the server itself. Uh, we're developing utilities to support entity identification and export uh, reports suitable for conducting automated and human directed redaction actions at scale and that at scale is a very important part that Cam will be talking about. Uh, developing an interface to allow processing archivists, librarians, museum curators to browse email collections and mark them as suitable for retention or needing further review for sensitivity um, and also developing utilities to apply machine learning to be able to support the kind of inferences that um, human beings are making about them. So from the very foundation, the idea is that this is computer assisted processing and appraisal. It's not that it's automation of these activities without a human in the loop. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is stop sharing my screen and um, hand this over to Cam. If there are any questions that people have during the transition uh, from, from me to Cam, we can certainly be uh, on them to answer them. Um, and yeah, as, as Cam's bringing that up, I'll point out that also in that first slide, there was a link to where you can get the slides and it's also in the chat. You should be able to see it through Zoom. So if you wanna follow along into any of these slides after the fact, feel free to do that. Great, so can everyone hear me? Cal, is that okay? Yep, I can hear you. Great, uh, so I'm gonna be going through these fairly quickly. Again, as Cal said, you can get to these slides. There's a lot of information on them. We'll leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so as part of this process of, of kind of supporting these tasks that Cal talked about, we have, we have two kind of parallel tool sets in development. Um, the first is lib, what we're calling Libratom, which is our core library. And this is essentially a tool that draws together um, a, a variety of different uh, supporting libraries to allow us to, uh, in an integrated way, process PST, OST, MBOX email formats, extract entities from the contents, um, and uh, generate kind of research quality data sets very quickly and for arbitrary size collections. Uh, there's a link here at the bottom to the GitHub where you can find detailed information on all that. And the, the, second, uh, the second tier of work here is this 
uh, iterative processing interface that Cal was uh, referring to, which kind of draws on the core functionality of that first interface and provides a, uh, a, a web console essentially that allows users to, to mark uh, messages within various collections for redaction, retention, uh, open access, and so on. And there's a, there's a GitHub link there that you can find uh, inf more information on that. Um, so a big motivation here for this is, uh, again, as Cal said, that lots of institutions have unprocessed PST and MBOX files. Um, we need better ways to kind of quickly ingest those, uh, those data sets and do these two things. A, be able to generate research quality uh, data sets that, uh, that we can perform machine learning tasks or uh, various types of analysis tasks on and then feed those into these other types of interfaces like the, this iterative processing interface. Uh, our tool set uses some uh, core libraries from Digital Forensics, uh, the industry standard uh, open source NLP platform. And the goal is to produce these data sets that, that you know, can be verified, that can be reproduced, that are reusable, uh, and that can quickly be transferred between environments irrespective of how they were produced. Um, we, uh, we dump all the contents of these data sets into fairly easy to use SQLite databases. Uh, I'm, I have a uh, I have a slide upcoming that'll that'll include that uh, that'll include that schema, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. Um, and the motivation for that is, you know, generating these research data sets gives us sort of a powerful tool to to uh, to expand our our, our uh, use of these email uh, sets, so we can you know push this data into machine learning tasks, into statistical analysis tasks, and so on. Um, and to do this, we want tools that can reliably and efficiently extract those features we're looking for that support swapping in of different models, which our tool does. So models for different languages or different entity types that scale to large collections. And we've put a significant amount of engineering in here for this type of scaling and that allow you to export the data in, in useful formats. Um, the schema I mentioned, I just left this slide in because uh, uh, I just want people to have a reference for it, but I'm not going to uh, discuss the schema directly here. Um, so here's an example of just to give you an idea of how uh, what kind of scale this tool works at uh, the the core libratom tool when we run it over the Enron corpus, which is about 54 gig about 800,000 messages almost 200 files. We can scan the entire PSG structure in 30 seconds. We can generate a simple re SQLite 3 report uh, without any entities, just the core structures and the core metadata attachments uh, attachment metadata and so on in about 12 minutes. And we can extract almost 20 million entities from this tool set in about two hours on a 16 core system. So, uh, so we can do this very, very quickly on relatively modest desktop hardware. And what this gives us the ability to do is to go back and uh, sort of uh, tweak these, uh, tweak the parameters on these uh, on these runs, uh, run them in uh, run, sorry, run the tool at multiple uh, times on different systems and so on without worrying about having to use a lot of uh, compute resources. Here's an example of the kinds of entities that are uh, that the tool pulls out. Um, so if you're familiar with Spacey, you'll uh, you'll note there's about 18 different uh, entity types that it can uh, generate, including organizations, people, uh, geopolitical entities, and so on. Um, the uh, the quality of this data is is quite high. So even on even using a small pre-trained model, uh, we get an F score of about 85 on. Uh, on open text data and email, so there is some noise, but it, uh, but for uh, for non-individual email tasks, for something a, a human's not going to be, uh, you know, making a, making an analysis decision on directly, this is this is fairly good quality data uh, to support large-scale ML tasks and other types of analytics. Uh, you can find all these tools on GitHub. Uh, our, our releases are pu pushed directly to PyPy, so they're very easy to, easy to install. And we have some uh, interactive notebooks that you can use as, uh, that you can play with as well uh, that kind of show some representative uh, features of these tools uh, uh, in, a, in an interactive uh, environment that doesn't require you to install anything. Uh, yeah, and I'll turn it back over to Cal for the, for the last section here. You're still muted, Cal. 
Thank you, Cam. So, um, so this is the processing interface. We had mentioned this company, uh, Cactus, who is uh, who, Cactus Group, who are in Durham, not too far from us in Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, they've been working with us to develop this processing interface. So the idea is that this requires um, very little installation on the part of the client. Somebody just needs a browser. It does have server software that runs in the background to facilitate all of these actions. Um, and it's basically the next step in the tool chain. The things that Cam was talking about in terms of extracting the metadata from the PSTs to very, very efficiently identifying, you know, timestamp metadata, how many messages there are, how many attachments, all those sorts of things are done and then fed into this interface so that someone making decisions can, um, can basically search over, navigate, and tag uh, the messages. So the idea is direct import of email corpora from PSTs or MBOX with automated entity identification. So entity, again, we mean things like organizations, um, events, people that are identified by the software called Spacey that Cam identified earlier. Uh, creation of processing accounts associated with individual email stores and backups. Interactive review and tagging, export of selected messages as EML for retention and or release. So our two main use cases here are um, archival appraisal and processing where you're making decisions around the email, you're trying to flag them as something to retain, something to review. Um, the other use case, and this comes uh, from our work with the State Archives, who are our primary partners here in North Carolina, um, is fulfillment of open records requests. So if somebody comes and says, give me all of the email relevant to this particular matter, um, you can conduct the queries and then extract the email from the subset that you've identified here. Um, and as I walk through this, you'll see that it's based on this essentially a faceted browsing kind of model where you can identify things like everything in a particular folder um, is the next functionality that's going to be uh, rolled out in the next release. Um, you can narrow things down and then sort of select them for export or for tagging. So at this level, you see the individual accounts. Um, and then these green boxes are these entities that have automatically been identified by Spacey and associated with them. So this is, you know, there's an organizational name, there's a date associated with it. Um, uh, in, this, in this view, you're seeing the various accounts associated with imports of one or more imported PST files. Um, it's showing you their status. Have they been, you know, have they been pulled in? Did it fail? Are they still in process? Uh, the top level message review within an account. So this is going into this particular person's email um, and then seeing the email messages. That's the view that you saw in that lead in slide with the organization law event and date. Uh, so those green ones are automatically assigned. The thing that you see as status, if this were interactive and I were running the software, I could click on that and there's a drop menu that shows a set of choices. So you could say, this is an open record. This is something that is a non-record content. This is something that uh, shouldn't be publicly accessible. Um, and so those are things that can be done at an individual message level or in bulk by selecting all of the messages that conform to some particular criteria. Uh, this is then um, individual messages being viewed within the client. Um, so you click down to the individual message level. Um, you can see in the top right corner there, this is one in which that open record status has been identified. So someone has gone through process and determined that this is something that should fall into the open record category that could be shared with the public. Um, you can see in this case, the message is unformatted. One of the design decisions anytime rendering uh, email is um, how it should actually be presented on the screen because email is often formatted in rich text, HTML, plain text all at the same time. Um, this is selection by classification. So for example, you could narrow down and show me only the restricted content from only certain email addresses over a given date range. So again, it's this sort of faceted model where you can narrow down based on what those criteria are. And then the results that you get can be something that you identify for retention, that you review further for archival description that might be subject to um, uh, provision of access if they're part of an open records request. Um, and then this is some of the, the administrative backend that shows you, for example, when actions are taken, there's this audit log, right? So for example, if somebody changes the restricted status to a message, that switch of the flag from true to false um, is then indicated within this audit history. Uh, so this is a reminder of where you can find um, the information about our project. 
raytom.web.unc.edu is our general project website. So that's more about, you know, hey, we're going off and uh, doing some event or something. Uh, primarily uh, in terms of the software, the place to go is GitHub where you can find the documentation and the walkthroughs and the software to download. As Cam mentioned, we have these Jupyter Notebooks. If you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, they're a, um, a nice way to be able to break down, essentially within a web page, a set of code. So you can go cell by cell and execute the code to see what it's doing without having to install anything in advance on your machine. Um, and then those processing interface deployment tools, which are more in development, um, you know, more in earlier development than the others. Uh, we're, as a reminder, four months into the second year of the project. Um, so a lot of the continuing work on this project is going to be testing out, deploying, and using that interface, but also feeding all of these things we've just talked to, to you about into machine learning processes. So that's a lot of the work that's forthcoming in the remainder of the project. Um, so that's what we have prepared. We'd be very happy to answer questions. Um, so maybe I'll leave that, that slide up temporarily, just in case anybody wants to follow the links. And again, feel free to download the slides as well that sh were shared with you in the chat. Wow, that was really uh, fascinating. Uh, thank you, Cal and Cam, for uh, that really interesting talk and for your extraordinary work on this amazing tool. Um, it's just a really phenomenal contribution. Thank you so much. And we're really delighted that you came to CNI to share uh, some information about this work that you've done. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite our attendees to submit any questions that they may have. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little box that says Q&A. And um, please feel free to submit your questions there. And uh, I will be passing those along to our panelists. Uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, just a little bit of housekeeping on my side, and I should start by introducing myself. I'm Diane Goldenberg Hart with CNI, and you have all probably seen my name in your inbox more times than I wish to remember. Um, so apologies for that. But I just want to welcome you to CNI's spring virtual meeting. So glad that you could join us for this project briefing. I hope that you will make time to join us for the many more that we have planned for you. Um, I wanna go ahead and share with you in your chat box now, um, a link to our schedule if you wanna check out what we have coming. And I see um, right now that we have a question that I wanna go ahead and let Cal and Cam address. Um, and the question is, are there ways to direct curation tasks to different individuals? Yeah, I didn't, I mean, feel free to jump in on this too, Cam, but um, yes, in terms of that, that web interface that you saw near the end of the talk, um, that's, that's part of the functionality built into it is the ability to set up different, um, you know, accounts. Right now, I think it's only limited to an administrative account and uh, just sort of typical user. Um, if you wanted to specify permissions in more detail than that, then it would require some additional work. And we're very interested in hearing people's thoughts about how that division of labor should be implemented. Um, but I believe that's correct, right, Cam? I think that in terms of that particular part of the software, um, the two categories are basically kind of admin and general user. Um, yeah, so if you wanted to restrict workflows, like sort of forensic style, you know, to have certain people working on very specific sections, that's not something that's 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 explicitly part of the uh, the interface right now. You know, we do have a we do have a fairly large backlog of uh, of modifications, uh, uh, you know, improvements to the software. Ultimately, it's about funding and time, and um, yeah. this was our kind of initial eight week effort on uh, on on developing the. Uh, um, this interface to, to begin with. So, and and yeah, um, and in terms of prioritization, the reason why a more fine grained breakdown hasn't been on our kind of short term plan is that um, both the state archives and the other partners we're working with most closely are usually using a, a relatively small set. It's like one or two people who are doing this work, um, so it's not a really high priority to bear, have a very high grained, uh, sorry, a very fine grained set of roles. But obviously, that's something we can revisit. 
Um, let's see, what else do you see in the email preservation area and how does this fit in with those other interests uh, and developments? Yeah, so it's a uh, great question. Hi, Don. <laughs> um, so um, there, there, was a, there was a report funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that looked at, there was a task force looking at issues related to email. Um, and um, so, you know, this, this project was uh, greatly inspired by that report. There's another project that um, I'm involved with that's um, going to be disseminating its work quite soon that was looking in a very exploratory way um, at ways to better facilitate generation of PDF from email. So if the only option you have, for example, in a government agency is to generate PDF from the email, um, that work is to further specify what, it, what is the guidance for how you should actually generate it so that it'll be most easily navigable and machine processable over time. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with EPAD, which is work that's been ongoing. Um, there are some differences both in terms of the primary use cases um, and the design approaches to, for example, EPAD and uh, Raytom. Uh, we collaborate very closely with each other. Uh, you know, members of the EPAD group are on our advisory board. We've been on their advisory boards and, and collaborate with them quite closely. Um, one of the distinct differences is that we try very hard to make sure you sort of saw this when Cam was showing that database structure, right? That the idea is you run these tools like Libretom or the web interface where you do the tagging all the data gets written to a database that's this very simple SQLite structure that then can get pulled in by other software. So we're trying to make it like as low lock-in as humanly possible so that basically you're running the tool to do the processing you're doing it with, but then you can rely on other ways to query and access the data. And that's motivated largely by one of our main use cases, which is supporting machine learning, is that we don't want you to have to sit in a particular environment to do those things. We want the data to be really easily machine readable so that you can pull it into other processes. Um, there's definitely quite a bit going on and it has been, you know, um, pretty heavily influenced by the, the task force report that I was just mentioning because it is, it's quite bizarre in a way if you were coming into the library and archives world from the outside to realize how little attention and resources has actually been put into the curation of email, given how long people have been using email. Um, I think when it comes to just the core preservation issues, as opposed to these larger curatorial ones, a lot of them are shared by any other preservation issues of just software dependencies and, uh, you know, what is the architecture you're going to use to save them. Uh, so, for example, PST files themselves are kind of a nightmare and probably not the best preservation format. Um, but then you have these issues of how you write the data out, what kinds of structures you attend to and which you don't, right? But um, it's, a, it's a changing landscape in which there's been quite a bit of activity in the past couple of years. So um, I would say stay tuned to some of those things. It's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. And Don, thanks you, as you can see. Um, if we have any more questions, please go ahead and um, type those in. I should also say that in this um, environment, we have the option to hand the mic over to anyone from the audience who is interested in engaging directly with Cal and Cam, um, either for a direct question or a comment. So um, if you would like to do that, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll move you into um, the mode where you can uh, have your microphone turned on. And while I'm giving folks a couple more minutes to think about what they may want to ask while we're here, again, uh, just another little plug for our meeting. Uh, we have recently put out a new call for project briefing proposal, the virtual phase. Um, we are soliciting proposals on issues having to do with the current crisis. Um, if you are working on issues that have to do with the COVID-19 crisis and related topics, um, I would urge you to go ahead and submit a proposal. We're trying to roll these out quickly during our meeting and the meeting will last through the end of May. So we have a lot of time to be thinking about um, the issues that are really um, coming to the fore for our community. So right there in your chat box, you should see a direct link to the um, proposal uh, form and the call that describes what we're looking for. I, I would, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Thank oh, you, Diane. I just wanted to add 
Uh, one more thing that occurred to me from that um, the earlier question is also, as I was talking about this kind of database structure that we've created, um, we've we've been working very closely with um, users of both Archivematic and Preservica also as examples of ways to make sure that however the data get generated, they can get pushed into these other spaces because um, this is a consistent theme of the work that we've done through support by the Mellon Foundation, whether it was BitCurator, BitCurator Access, BitCurator NLP. We're always trying to create this kind of processing environment that allows you to relatively easily hand stuff off to Archive Space, Fedora, whatever it might be, as opposed to thinking you have to sit inside of that environment the whole time. And so the, the, the reason I brought this back is I wanted to to make sure that we added the plug that you know we can only really facilitate those handoffs um, when there are people out in the profession experimenting with us with mm -hmm. them and telling us what works and what doesn't right so if you're using any of these tools and the outputs from them don't conform to what you need to go into some other environment please don't feel like it's going to offend us to hear that we need to hear that so that we can figure out how to support those kinds of processes also we have about eight months of development left on this project. So this is, this, there, there are changes coming as well. Yep. So, you know, we're a relatively small team and we rely a great deal on people um, in the profession trying out the software and telling us, you know, what's broken, what's useful, what needs to be fixed. So please let us know. That's a great reminder. Do you have that frame with your contact information, um, that slide, maybe you want to put that up? Yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and bring it back up again. So thank you both again. Um, there we go. Ways to get in touch with uh, Cal and Cam. If you want to talk to them further, or if you've got some feedback or ideas, thanks for sharing that. And before I uh, close out this webinar, just want to let Cal and Cam, if you've got any last closing thoughts, um, I don't. I would just say, you know, certainly stay in touch and let us know if any of these things are um, useful to you in ways that we expected or didn't expect, um, things you'd like us to try to prioritize that would make the software more useful to you. And it's all, I, I think we've already mentioned this, but it's all free and open source software too. So um, if you hate what we're doing, but love our code, grab it and fork it and do something else with it. We hope people don't do that, but it's all out there for people to use, as has been the case with all of this work we've done through support by the Mellon Foundation. All the code is available through GitHub. That's great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we can't hear all the applause that I know is happening in living rooms across America right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing all of this with CNI. We appreciate you spending your time here, Cal and Cam, and also to all of our attendees. Uh, be well and, and take care and hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Cal and Cam. Take care, all. <laughs>